So, okay, this has happened to us ever since day one, so to speak. Um, I'm just trying to move this thing, okay. And it's just a part of America's history, sad history of using race to justify exploitation. So this is uh, the greatest hits. Uh, I mean, basically, since we've come here, um, there have always been laws and things done to really literally, uh, you know, put the foot on the scale against us. And I'm going to cover some of these, but uh, you can see they span all the way through the present time. It started in 1854 with the California Supreme Court uh, ruled that Asian immigrants could not testify against whites in court. So that meant it was open season uh, on Asians, on Chinese. And it, the ugly history of anti-Asian racism actually started in California because that's where the uh, majority of Chinese first came. Our governor in 1867 was a gentleman named Henry H. Haight who built his campaign on anti-Chinese and anti-Black hysteria. And uh, he espoused white nationalist values. And during his tenure as governor, he blocked the adoption of the 14th and the 15th Amendments that uh, to make sure that non-white Californians could not have citizenship nor voting rights. So after he lost his bid for reelection, his next stop was the city of Alameda. So he moved to Alameda and uh, he immediately ran for the newly incorporated city's board of trustees where he became the president. And throughout his tenure, he maintained his belief that African and Asian people were inferior to white people. And it only took 148 years, but Alameda finally changed the school named after him to love in uh, 2019. So the other thing I discovered while doing my research is that the, um, the we all know about the Southern Ku Klux Klan, but the Western Klan uh, made its name assaulting Chinese immigrants. So they organized around going after Chinese here in California. So uh, Chinese immigrants were attacked, lynched, and burned out of their early settlements. Oakland had two other Chinese Chinatowns, but they were all destroyed uh, during these years. And um, all the small towns along the Sierra Nevada foothill railroad lines where many Chinese laborers had uh, settled down after the railroads were completed, uh, they were also burned out of those places too. So here's a new fact. 10% um, of LA's Chinese population was, um, was mur murdered in a massacre in 1871. So overall, there were f at least 55 anti-Chinese riots um, before and after 1882. And you can see uh, that the, uh, uh, the ones in California were all along the railroad, a lot of them were uh, along the, the path of the railroads um, where Chinese had attempted to settle after they built the railroads. And before the Chinese Exclusion Act, which everyone uh, hopefully knows about by now in 1882, uh, they went after Chinese women because um, they didn't want the Chinese men to be able to have children and actually grow a Chinese population here. I've always said that if, if were it not for the uh, 1875 Page Act and then the 1882 Exclusion Act, I would be governor by now <laughs> and Fong would be president. <laughs> But basically, uh, the 1875 Page Act um, identified all um, Asian women as prostitutes, and so we were denied entry to the United States. <clears throat> so this thing, in order to justify it, uh, the common uh, knowledge or common uh, myth was that Asian women were sexualized and objectified. And um, <clears throat> according to the... Um, National Asian Pacific Women's For Forum and common knowledge, we've always been seen as temptresses and sexual objects. And so the fact that those words were used by the killer in Atlanta to describe Asian American women cannot be separated from those historical contexts from which we came from. So 
Um, ever since the 1940s, when wars began to be, American wars began to be fought in Asia, um, Asian women <clears throat> have fallen into that category of being sexualized. And a lot of uh, American GIs, uh, men, young men coming of age going to war in, uh, and being in Japan and Korea and Vietnam and the Philippines and Thailand, uh, their first sexual encounters were with Asian women who had no choice but to uh, sell their bodies to in order to survive and support their families. And so these, the, many of the men who came back from war have had a certain perspective of Asian women that is, is, is uh, pretty distorted. In, of course, here's the famous 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. So we have the ignominy of being the first group to be ever discriminated against and banned from the United States. So um, they suspended the immigration of all uh, laborers from China and they denied the right of naturalization. In other, in other words, if you came to this country uh, from another country, uh, from, from China, and then subsequently Asian, Asian countries, you were not allowed to ever be become a US citizen. So that leads us to the internment of 120,000 Japanese Americans in 1942. Uh, basically, over half of these Japanese Americans were actually U.S. citizens because these were children born in the United States. So even though we could not be naturalized citizens, we could, if we were born here, uh, we, we were citizens. Uh, so they herded off 120,000 Japanese Americans to internment camps solely because they had Japanese ancestry. So um, in history books, if it's ever mentioned, it's claimed that it originated from the Roosevelt White House, but it was in fact born in the fever dreams of California politicians who were the ones who promoted the cry to exclude Japanese residents from the West Coast. So fast forward to 1982, um, Vincent Chin would have been 66 yesterday uh, he was a 26-year-old Chinese-American, and during the height of the uh, anti-Japan -Jap hysteria, because uh, Detroit automakers were uh, losing business because uh, people were buying Japanese cars. They were a lot cheaper, and they ran a lot better. And so Detroit's failure to meet the moment uh, had them putting the blame on Japan. So in Detroit, uh, fundraisers in Detroit uh, had... Uh, Japanese cars, you, you, you pay money at a fair to, to smash a Japanese car. And the face of the front of the Japanese car was literally um, like a, a, a caricature of a Japanese person with buck teeth. So it was in that atmosphere that a 26 year old Chinese American was out uh, on night on the town on uh, his, his bachelor party uh, that he had words with a couple of uh, white Detroit auto workers who uh, called him a Jap. Uh, he's Chinese, so he, they should have said chink, I guess. But nonetheless, they basically um, had a scuffle. Vincent landed a blow, and then uh, the, the 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 two Detroit auto workers um, decided to chase them through the streets of Detroit. And after about 15 or 20 minutes, they, uh, they caught up with Vincent and beat him to death with a bat. Uh, the judge gave these two men probation and a fine of $3,000. They never sit, served a day in jail for murdering this young man. So uh, on the day of his uh, expected wedding, his mother was planning his funeral. So this, uh, Vincent, the Vincent Chin case actually galvanized uh, Chinese Americans and Asian Americans throughout the United States. And so this was like the beginning of of the awakening of the baby boomer Asian Americans. In 1989, again, associated with what happens internationally, there was a lot of anti-Vietnamese feeling in the United States because of the Vietnam War, which <clears throat> uh, resulted in, in um, Asians being attacked again for being Asian, for being mistaken for Vietnamese, for causing the war in Vietnam. 
Uh, basically, in 1989, there was a massacre of five Southeast Asian children in a Stockton schoolyard. And I was uh, reporting on this story. So I actually went to their memorial service. So basically, uh, this, this young man uh, blamed his, uh, the fact, he, he, he blamed the fact that he was jobless and having trouble in life on uh, Vietnamese people and gooks. And he was really upset that his former uh, schoolyard in Stockton was now had a lot of uh, Southeast Asian children in it where he grew up. So he basically dress, dressed up in camouflage and um, set off uh, an explosion in, in his van. So people came running out and it was recess. So he basically uh, took a bead and aimed at only the Asian children and killed uh, five children, six and most of them were six years old, one was nine, uh, four, five, four were uh, Cambodian and one was Vietnamese. So this really affected uh, all of us, but it was never really publicized as an anti-Asian hate crime. It was publicized as, as um, and caused the first time California passed an, a ban on assault rifles, which has expired by the way. So this is a picture from their funeral where these <clears throat> children, caskets were. I still can't <laughs> think about this case. So let's move to Alameda. In 1982 is the first kind of re record of uh, Chinese or Asians being even seen in, in Alameda. And they were hired as cooks and house, house help uh, for the, uh, the folks who, uh, located into the Gold Coast as their uh, vacation homes. But the uh, newspapers really uh, didn't treat the Chinese very well, saying that we had odors and unsanitary conditions, as well as uh, we were common thieves. That didn't stop them from relying on Chinese laborers to turn Alameda into an island. So much of the digging that, took, uh, that needed to be take place to turn Alameda from an estuary into an island was done by Chinese laborers. So uh, unbeknownst to me until I did this research was that uh, the Ku Klux Klan uh, had its center in the North, Northern California in Oakland. And uh, in 1925, this is the uh, Kaiser Convention Center for those of us who still remember when it was still uh, functioning. Uh, but there was a giant cross burning in there uh, for, uh, by the Ku Klux Klan. Um, so just one year later, the Ku Klux Klan uh, was on the Alameda City Council, came to the Alameda City Council, where uh, they weren't dressed like this, I hope, but this is how <laughs> the Klan uh, was pictured in 1926. But they came to oppose the establishment of a Japanese language school in Alameda. So here's this famous color-coded redlining of the city of Alameda in the 1930s. Um, borrowers, people could not borrow money to buy homes in certain places in Alameda because they were redlined. And they were redlined because they had 3% um, black families or Orientals that resided in the area. And if you look at this map, you'll see that the entire north side of Alameda was redlined as an unsafe investment. And just and then the green areas are where it was deemed uh, clean and good, right? The best places in Alameda. And if in, in two more slides, I'll show you a slide of the fact that these areas still remain, uh, have very few Asians or Blacks living in them. So that redlined area along the north uh, side of Alameda was, uh, became home to 900 Japanese, Japanese Americans in the 1930s. So the Japanese community spanned uh, part from the Park Street Bridge to Encinal Avenue, which is now Chochenyo Park. So if you think about that whole piece of land uh, going from the bridge up to Chochenyo Park, imagine if you will, there was a vibrant Japanese American community living here. And uh, as I look at this map of all the uh, businesses and stores and services that existed at that time, uh, I only see two that remain, and they're both uh, faith communities, the Buena Vista United Methodist Church 
and the uh, Buddhist Church of Alameda, which uh, you see in the uh, top right side of this of the map. Um, so the Japanese children, even though there were no signs up, the Japanese children as adults uh, recall that uh, basically they were not allowed in the pool at Neptune Beach. They can only go and watch. So in 1942, all of those 900 people were erased from Alameda. And in fact, Alameda was the first city in California to have their Japanese evacuated. So the Japanese community uh, was just told to pack up whatever, uh, you know, a, one, one, one piece of luggage that they could carry each. And they had to abandon their homes and businesses and herded into mass incarceration camps solely because of their ancestry. Literally overnight, the once thriving Japan town in Alameda was decimated. And it still has yet to be researched and told the story of who benefited from the forfeit, forfeiture of all those businesses and land on Park Street uh, from the bridge on. Uh, who, who benefited from all these Japanese Americans being herded off into camps? So today, over 24,000 Asian and Pacific Islanders live in Alameda, comprising 31% of the population. And this census tract map, if you can, if you memorize the previous map, shows the areas uh, where there are significant Asian populations. So we see uh, Harbor Bay, Bay Farm Island has the highest concentration of Asian Americans, but uh, these gray areas here are where there are very few. And so those gray areas are also the blue green areas in that previous map where uh, we were banned, uh, Asians and Blacks were banned from uh, buying property. And you can see that of the, uh, the majority of the Asian Pacific Islanders living in Alameda are not of Japanese ancestry. So uh, because of the model minority myth, which it is a myth, uh, a lot of people think that we're doing very well when actually that completely masks and hides the fact that 30.4% of Alamedans, uh, of the Alamedans living below the poverty line are actually Asians. So this is 2018. So you can see that these, these bar charts show the percentage of each group of, of what their representation of, of all the people living at the poverty line in Alameda. So 30.4% of all the people out of all the people living in Alameda who live below the poverty line are actually of Asian ancestry. And the second uh, largest percentage is uh, whites and third is blacks. And you know, the reason why you say, well, that doesn't make sense, but it does make sense because um, Asians do make up uh, about 30% of the population, but the other groups uh, you know, are just lower in number. So we saw the return of blatant racism uh, with the, uh, with, uh, in 2016 with the uh, campaign for presidency. And so uh, the first thing he did was no Muslims, build the wall against rapists. I mean, all of these things uh, just normalized being public and open about racism. So Asian Americans also, as forever foreigners, uh, began to experience this as well. So we all know about this. And we all know that if you just ignore it and let it happen, um, there are deadly consequences. So the way to justify taking advantage of people is to dehumanize and diminish them. And uh, Asians have been, been described as immoral, foreign, other disloyal, disease spreaders, self-serving, over-sexual and under-sexual, you know, go figure. All it means is that we're just two-dimensional cartoon characters and not full, fully formed human beings or perceived as such. So this kind of led to uh, it being okay to go and kill people uh, who were Asian. And uh, everyone was shocked, but many Asians were not shocked per se. It was just a time bomb wait, waiting to happen. The six Asian American women who were killed were all, um, five of them were shot in the head. 
all six of them worked in one of the three spas ranging in age from 44 to 74. Five were mothers and two were grandmothers. Two were US citizens, four were Korean Americans, one was Chinese American, one was a Chinese national. These are the women. Uh, one is, is missing in the sense that uh, there was no photograph of her. But it's interesting to note if you recall that lovely photo with the uh, American GIs with an Asian Chinese woman, is that two of these women were uh, divorced from American GIs. So this legacy of having this exotic, erotic um, fantasy in people uh, results in many times divorce, uh, a battery, <laughs> domestic abuse, and um, single women having to raise their families on their own and, and working in, in jobs that uh, some people disdain and look down upon, but working to survive and raise their families. Whoops. Sorry. So we saw this outpouring of support for Asian Americans and against anti-Asian violence uh, in the aftermath of those killings. And there were rallies everywhere, and uh, some of you may or may not have attended them, but have seen them on television. I was really, uh, the uh, Garden Grove Mayor Pro Tem Kim Nguyen uh, just kind of expressed how many of us were feeling in saying that it's not our job and should not be our job to educate you. We are enraged, scared, exhausted, and traumatized, telling you why our stories matter begging you to stop aiding in the erasure, erase, erasure of our Americanness, like I could say that, and to please stop making excuses for white violence. Um, so oftentimes when Asian residents attempt to report incidents of race, racist slurs, vandalism, or graffiti, their concerns are often dismissed, reinforcing the belief that we don't matter. So many don't even try. Asian American kids are being bullied. People are being spat on, threatened, and killed. Enough is enough. Uh, you will notice that a higher percentage of Asian American students are not have not returned to this hybrid in school uh, that's going on because uh, for a variety of reasons. But one of the reasons is that for the, for the year that Asian Americans and everyone has been at home uh, learning online, um, Asian American children uh, were not being bullied and picked on. So it's, <clears throat> to me, it's very hurtful to think that Asian children don't wanna go back to school because they're being bullied. And if you look at the data, you'll see that um, in, in the uh, annual, the biannual, uh, uh, polling of children in public schools that usually the racial group who report being bullied the most are Asian children. And who's doing anything about it? And we all know from all the, uh, the videos on TV that Asian seniors are being robbed, spat on, threatened, and killed. So racial trauma is a real thing. And what we see among the Asian American population now are many of these symptoms. Racial trauma is not a mental illness. <clears throat> and basically, you know, we have to work our way out of it. Oops. Of course I keep, uh... so we have to realize that racist slurs and racist jokes are part of a continuum of violence against people of color and Asians. The fact that uh, immigrant families have been torn apart by ICE, um, Cambodians have been deported uh, because of, of previous uh, situations they, they, were, they found themselves into in the past. Um, all these things are happening to Asian Americans. So I don't know if any of you have taken bystander training. Um, you have to take it more than once or you have to take it and go back and read the five Ds. But basically bystander training is actually a very useful tool uh, 
to give you um, a set of things that you can choose to do uh, if you see an incident happening. And uh, if you go, if you just Google bystander training um, and Hollaback, you'll find uh, all of the information you need and how you can sign up for a free class. So you can actually learn how to be an ally and how to be someone who acts when they see something happening. So there is a database uh, for to report anti-Asian incidents. And so uh, if you notice, and I, I've lost track, but it's over 3,000, close to 4,000 cases have been reported so far in the United States. And basically this data has been used to um, be able to identify and quantify the problem. Even though um, most people say that the number is probably one-tenth of the actual cases because uh, people are, are ra rarely report what happens to them. But it's if you Google stop AAPI hate, you can find their website and um, please encourage anyone you know who has experienced uh, an, an incident to report it because it gets tallied up. And I think the president of the United States just signed on to the, uh, to the, to the bill that will uh, increase reporting and look at ways to try to address this hatred. So here in Alameda County, if uh, a person is subjected to, uh, to a hate crime, they can call the Alameda County hate crime number um, to report after the fact. Uh, their investigators will follow up with, with you to get the details and if possible, go and, and talk to or uh, contact the people who've perpetuated the hate crime. So, uh, you know, after the George Floyd murder, uh, it came to light for a lot of non-Black people about the talk, the talk that many Black parents have to have with their children as they come of age. But I realized that every single parent or every single adult needs to have the talk about racism. <clears throat> the reason why it's been so easy to not know about anti-Asian hate is because we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it. And so now uh, it took people being murdered to get us to talk about it. You don't know what to say, then it's time we all figured it out. Everyone needs to have a talk about racism, whether you're white, black, Asian, Latino, whatever race you are, we live in a country which has a problem with racism and we need to all talk about it.